in this session, we'll discuss the decision analysis without and with probabilities. Probability is a number that describes the likelihood of an event occurring. So when we say uh, with probability, we mean that we have some estimate or maybe a very good um, feel about the likelihood of the event. But sometimes we don't. Right? So uh, in this discussion, we'll focus on trying to make a decision still um, with and without knowing about such a numerical description of the uh, likelihood of events happening. All right. Now, um, then what is our input? If we start off with discussing decision making without knowledge of the probability, uh, we have some estimates, and uh, whether with or without probabilities, we will have this set of information. Right. First is a bunch of payoffs. So we'll know the payoffs precisely, accurately, and exhaustively. We know all the numbers um, for all kinds of uh, outcomes. Okay, so nothing is hidden from us. We are not uh, having a very vague idea about the payoff. We have very clear, precise ideas about the payoffs, and these payoff quantities don't change right uh, throughout our decision making process. So, if our decision making process is one millisecond, then the payoff, uh, whether it's good or bad, high or low in terms of rewards or benefits, uh, wouldn't change too drastically. And if our decision making is one year, if we have to make that kind of one year long decision, then uh, the payoffs essentially are still good throughout the years. Okay, so so that's the the sense of how we interpret these payoffs. Payoffs in real life could be profits, could be revenues, could be benefits, could be um, all kinds of numerical uh, equivalent or indices or um, measurements that the higher the number is the better is for us. So that's the payoff, the benefits that we get. Second set of information is, of course, the state of nature. All right, the state of nature um, will be what kind of outcomes we will see unfolding in front of us. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we certainly need to know exhaustively what will be all the possibility. So we will talk about it as possibilities. All right. So all the possibilities must be laid out in front of us. No part of it is missing. Example, um, will tomorrow be raining or not raining? Okay. Is that exhaustive possibility? Yeah, because it is either raining or not raining. But it could be raining, drizzling a little bit, droplets of water, but not really down heavy downpour. Do we consider that raining? So there is some kind of uh, gray area, if you might, we might call it, but still we have to draw a line to make sure that it is discrete nature, right? So it is either raining or not raining, and we have covered all possibilities. Of course, we can make them uh, more fine grained. Uh, the possibilities can be. Uh, more than two possible outcomes. We can say no rain, drizzling, or heavy downpour. Yeah, because no rain makes sense to us more than whether it is hot day or warm day or cool day, all without rain, right? But but maybe our decision making is should we bring umbrella, right? So if that's the case, rain will concern us more than whether it's hot day. I mean, of of course, I'm ironing out the fact that we might pop, we might. Uh, we might carry umbrella because of hot sun, um, but raining or not raining, okay? Raining, little bit of rain, and uh, heavy downpour. So those are possibilities. And of course, if we have knowledge about probabilities, then we will use probabilities to describe these possibilities. And I'm making a clear differentiation between the two, right? Possible outcomes need not have equal likelihood of occurrence. Uh, the way we describe the likelihood of occurrence will be probabilities. But right now we are talking about without knowledge of probabilities. All right, so, so we are bringing in probabilities at the same time to know that it is lacking here. Right? In this part of our discussion, we don't have knowledge or we don't trust the numbers that we have about the likelihood of these possibilities happening. And the third set of information that we must have to begin with 
will be, of course, the set of uh, decision alternatives. Okay, so these are our options. What kind of options do we have? What choices do we have? Now, if you only have one choice, then uh, ironically, you have no choice, right? But to continue with that, because whatever the outcome, you only have one choice, uh, one decision alternative. Um, mom says, bring umbrella no matter what. Well, even if it's not raining, just bring. Well, if that's the case, you have no choice, right? So if you have only one option, um, there is no need for decision making. So basically, for all such problems, we have at least two options or more. So the more options we have, it might or might not be better because uh, we might be stuck with evaluating which option is better and all that. But essentially, this discussion today in this session is exactly to make the best uh, decision out of all these various options. Choose one, okay? Choose one. Uh, knowing these three sets of information, okay? So let's delve into the discussion about decision making um, without knowledge about the probabilities, right? So idea is that uh, we have three ways, three very commonly used ways to make our choice, our best choice. Um, one is maxi max, okay? Or we call it sometimes the optimistic algorithm. But I prefer to sort of study it and remember it by the name Maxi Max, and we'll see why in a while. The other way to determine the best option out of all the choices will be Maxi Mid or conservative or sometimes called a pessimistic uh, method. And thirdly, we have the uh, mini max regret method. Okay, I should highlight the M for a good reason. All right, mini max regret. So we're going to talk about these three um, methods of making decisions without knowledge of probabilities, okay? To, the, 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 the way to uh, study it best is that the maximax, maximin, minimax regret, the name itself tells us what to do. Uh, by going from right to left, we will first determine the maximum of the payoffs and then take the maximum of all the maximum, right? So in maximin, we'll first determine the minimum and then take the maximum of all the minimum. And finally, for minimax regret, we first calculate the regret table, then we take the maximum, and then we find the minimum of all the maximum. So the names themselves uh, suggest what we do with the algorithm. That's why I like to uh, sort of learn them by these names, okay? Now, as we started off saying, we need to have three sets of information namely the payoffs, the numbers. The numbers are known, they stay relatively constant, they don't change with time as you're making decisions, um, and they correspond to um, the, the, the complete set of uh, possible outcomes, state of nature one, two, and three. Okay, So is it going to be heavy rain, drizzling, or no rain? And then we have a set of decisions to make. Should we bring umbrella? Um, or not bring umbrella. But in this case, we have three choices. Okay, So we might say that S1, economy is doing well, or will do better. S2, economy says so-so. S3, economy goes down. Um, D123 could be buy more shares, stay put, sell our shares. Okay, So notice that economy does well or not is something that is not within our control, not within the decision maker's control in particular, right? So I'm trying to make a decision as to whether I should sell my shares, stay put, or buy more shares from the market, um, knowing that the economy in a day's time, in a week's time, in a month's time, in a year's time, 
will become better, stay put, so so, or become worse. Okay. And these are exhaustive possibilities of the economy, at, which is beyond my control, the decision maker. So what I'm trying to highlight here is that state of nature, I was giving the example of raining, not raining. Of course, this is weather, it's beyond anyone's control, so it has to be state of nature. But oftentimes, uh, in, a, in, in fact, in, in more practical examples, state of nature does not have to be something that is beyond everyone's control. So long as it is beyond the decision maker's control, that's good enough to be considered state of nature. Another example, right? Um, S1, S2, S3 could be exam is very difficult. Exam is uh, doable, right? I think I can do well, but not, not sure if I can score A+. Plus. Uh, exam is too easy. Okay, so we have S1, S2, S3, right? Now, I say they are S1, S2, S3 because I am thinking from the perspective of a student who can only be surprised by, or uh, whether pleasantly or unpleasantly surprised by, the exam paper when he or she opens up the exam paper at the exam hall. Um, but is S1, S2, S3 really state of nature? Uh, absolutely, answer is no, because if you ask the examiner who sets the exam questions, uh, that is a person, yeah, and it's not about weather and elements. So is if you ask that, that instructor, that examiner, is the exam going to be very difficult, very easy or doable? An examiner will say, well, um, I will think it is doable because he or she will decide rather than uh, toss a dice and, and hope for the best, right? So it depends on who you ask and who is the decision maker. And then the events uh, may or may not become state of nature and sometimes it's not easy to tell that that's why uh, especially in human decisions and human uh, created outcomes so therefore and, and oftentimes these are also very practical situations so it is important to understand that state of nature is not just purely about nature but also uh, well not just purely about nature but uh, more specifically it is uh, the outcomes that are beyond the decision maker's ability to control. And that's why there is uh, an element of surprise and that's why there's an element of probability. Right? We don't have a description of the probability right now, but that will come later. But I'm saying that uh, decision alternatives, on the other hand, will never, at least in this theory, will never have probabilities. Okay, whether with or without probabilities, we are not going to have probabilities to describe decision alternatives. Why? Because the decision maker has these choices. Okay, I might be um, wavering, I might be at a loss, I might be confused, I might be thinking, I might need more information. Uh, whatever I'm saying, the decision maker, I'm not having a probability. Hmm, let me see. Um, I will carry umbrella with a probability of 0 0.9. Now, I decided not to, so that probability doesn't make sense. You know, so it, it is not meaningful to talk about uh, probabilities with decision-making alternatives. Huh? So with that in mind, let's, let's uh, delve into this example. How do we decide based on these three sets of information, right, the x-axis, y-axis, and the and the payoffs, how do we decide which is the best decision alternative? When we say decide, we always choose one uh, alternative out of all the alternatives. We do not choose the state of nature. Okay, So regardless of how the table, this matrix or this table is being oriented, even if we transpose it, we still talk about which D, right? D1, D2, or D3, do we pick? We never talk about S. So it's not really going by row or column, it's going by the meaning of the labels on the rows or columns. Okay, 